As the story goes, back around the turn of the century, there was a woman named Belinda who fell in love with a local man named Jim. Their relationship was great at first, but over time, Jim became violent and abusive, causing Belinda to feel trapped, afraid of what he'd do if she left. So despite all of her friend's warnings, she stayed with him. That is, until Belinda gave birth to a baby boy. Looking at her newborn son, she couldn't stand the thought that Jim's anger would come to harm him, and she decided to take action. She fled into the woods to make her escape, but an angry Jim caught wind of her plan and chased after her. He eventually caught her and in a fit of rage, drowned her and the baby in the river. After Belinda went missing, the people in the town began to worry about her and suspected Jim had done something, which he denied having anything to do with it, of course. They searched the woods looking for her one night when the searchers caught sight of a glow in Brown Mountain. Thinking it might be Belinda or somebody else carrying a lantern, they followed the light. When they reached it, the light disappeared, but right beneath where it had been, they found Belinda's body, and Jim was brought to justice. This probably didn't happen, but it's a great bit of folklore around a phenomenon that's been well documented for hundreds of years. The fact is there are several places around the world that have these kinds of stories. Tales of ghost lights, glowing orbs, and other unexplainable objects that seem to happen with surprising regularity. So is there anything actually to this? What's behind the ghost lights? People have experienced ghost lights throughout the centuries and all around the world. Sometimes these mysterious lights are called spook lights, corpse candles, will-o'-the-wisps, and ghost orbs. Depending on where they're seen, they may even have a specific name like the Marfa lights. Cultures also offer different explanations for what causes them. Some tales say fairies or leprechauns cause the lights, or maybe it's goblins or the spirits of children who died young. And some tales are very specific. Like in Wales, there's a story of a man named Will whose wicked deeds doomed him to wander the earth for eternity. Even though he's not allowed into heaven or hell, he is allowed to carry an ember from the fires of hell to light his way. In Japanese folklore, the Hitodama is a visible soul of a human that appears blue, white, orange, or red, and slowly floats around just above the ground. The Min lights in Australia's Outback are fast-moving lights that have been known to even stalk people. Ghost lights have five characteristics, according to the Ghost Research Society. They appear in remote areas, they're elusive and can be seen from different angles and distances, they react to noise or light by receding or disappearing, they're accompanied by hummings, buzzings, or outbreaks of gaseous material, and they're associated with folklore surrounding a haunting because of an accident or tragedy. The Brown Mountain lights are found in North Carolina, where they show up in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and they can appear either blue or red. Native American tribes like the Cherokee and the Catawba reported them as far back as the year 1200. They believed the lights were the spirits of their warriors who were killed in a battle that year. During the U.S. Civil War, soldiers would write home about the lights when they saw them. And the lights have actually been heavily researched by the Smithsonian Institution and the U.S. Geological Society. Theories about what causes them include reflections from moonshine stills, swamp gas, and unusual atmospheric conditions that reflect electricity. The Smithsonian dismissed the moonshine theory, actually, saying that there weren't enough stills to actually cause all those lights. Also, there aren't any swamps around Brown Mountain, and the lights were long seen before electricity was invented. And because they go so far back into history and have such a connection to the local people, there are tons of stories and folklore around the lights, one of which is the story I started this video off with. Actually, if you want a great breakdown of all the folklore around the Brown Mountain lights, Windagoon has a great video on it. I'll put a link down in the description. Marfa, Texas is about 80 kilometers from the Mexican border. It sits in far west Texas, and it's home to a thriving community of artists and free thinkers. Actually, a pretty neat little town. And it's also been home to the Marfa lights for more than 140 years. A young cowhand named Robert Reed Ellison was the first to say that he saw the lights in 1883. The story was that he was driving cattle through the plains and he got so scared that he ran back into town to tell everybody about it. Everyone from farmers to World War II soldiers to couples making out in parked cars have seen the lights, usually along a prairie southeast of Martha known as the Paisano Pass. In fact, the actor James Dean supposedly was so obsessed with him that he kept a telescope in his room at the hotel when he was shooting in Marfa for the movie Giant in 1956. Today, people from all around the world come to see the lights on clear nights, but there's no telling when they show up. It's pretty random. They only show up at about 30 times a year, and it's usually around sunrise or sunset. People have said that the orbs are believed to be everything from ghosts of Spanish conquistadors to UFOs to car headlights. Along a certain 250 kilometer stretch of the Mekong River in the Nong Kai province in Thailand, glowing red fireballs shoot up in the sky as high as 183 meters from the water. People have also seen them shooting up from lakes, ponds, and other rivers in the Asan region of Thailand. They range in size from small bubbles to basketball size. And for a few evenings in October, they can be seen in the hundreds or even the thousands. In fact, they seem to happen so regularly that there's a festival held there every year in October. It's actually called the Naga Fireball Festival, or sometimes the Fayanak Festival, and it marks the end of the Buddhist Lent season. 
People gather along the riverbanks and light fireworks and floating lanterns until the time comes that the lights actually appear, usually shooting out of the water in the middle of the river until they disappear high in the air. The Naga fireballs get their name from a legendary sea serpent called Naga, who is said waits at the bottom of the river until the end of the Lent season. And the legend says that the lights are the breath of the serpent as it wakes up. This sounds awesome. I would actually love to see this festival. Anybody who's been to this festival, please share about it in the comments. There's a mysterious basketball-sized glowing orb that appears in the old Route 66 in northeast Oklahoma on a six-kilometer rural road nicknamed the Devil's Promenade. It's been named the Hollis Light, the Joplin Spook Light, the Ozark Spook Light, the Tri-State Spook Light, and the Hornet Spook Light, after the former town of Hornet. But it's always a spook light. And there are claims that it's been showing up in the night sky since 1881. Some people think it's the ghost of a murdered Osage chief. Some say it's the spirit of a Quapaw maiden who drowned herself in the river when her warrior was killed in battle. And others say it's the lantern of a miner searching for his lost family. The Hestalen Valley is located just to the south of Alen in Norway. Uh, and it's in this picturesque setting where one can see the Hestalen lights. They've been seen as big as cars and can float up to around two hours. Sometimes they go down the valley and then fade away. They're usually red, yellow, blue, or white when seen at night. And in the daytime, they look like metallic objects. One report was from Age and Ruth Mary Moe, who saw what they described as a burning fireball in the evening sky from their kitchen window on December 8, 1981. They kind of peaked in the 80s. They started appearing up to 20 times a week, so it's no surprise that UFOologists became excited. And so did other researchers like astrophysicists, chemists, data and electroengineers, and geophysicists. So much so that the Hizdalan Automatic Measurement Station was installed to register and record the appearance of the lights in 1998. And on 2018, the Hesdalen Observatory was established on a nearby mountaintop where up to four researchers are stationed to study the lights year-round. Michigan's Upper Peninsula is where you can see the Paulding light, which has been seen since the 1960s. It's an intensely bright light that appears in the distance at the top of a hill outside the city of Paulding. One legend claims that it's the light of a swaying lantern held by the ghost of a railroad worker. Uh, the story says that he was crushed when an oncoming train hit rail cars that had stalled on the tracks. Some people believe that it's the train's light and that that train is now a ghost itself. Ghost trains. And then there are some that think that it's a grandparent's distraught spirit looking for a lost grandchild. And the spirit's lantern has to keep getting relit, which is why the light kind of comes and goes. As mentioned earlier, the Min Min lights are found in Australia's outback. People describe them as blue, white, or yellow fast-moving balls that glow in the dark. And sometimes the light will split in two. And yeah, like I said before, they're, they're known to stalk people, leaving people frightened and confused, obviously. Some Aboriginal people believe they're the spirits of elders looking after their country. Yeah, the Min Min's are different. All the others are just kind of like lights off in the distance. The Min Min's will apparently actually chase you. Yeah, I would run like a friggin' madman. Good thing I've been working out and training lately. Thanks for noticing. And I've been doing it with today's sponsor, Copilot. Okay, so here's the deal. I've, I've tried just about everything there is that you can think of to stay in shape. I've done the workout videos, which are hard to stick with. I've done sports leagues, which take up a lot of time. And I've worked out with personal trainers and gyms, which are really expensive. Copilot, I have to say, is a nice in between all those things. There are workouts that you can do on your phone, in your home, on your own time, but the workouts are designed by an actual certified trainer. My trainer's name is Devin. We met at the beginning and I told him what I was trying to do, what my goals are, what I was hoping to get out of it, what equipment I had available, and then he designed a program just for me with the equipment that I had available. And it's, it's been great. He checks in with me once or twice a week to keep me accountable. We all know that's super important. And then he adjusts the workouts according to what I need. In fact, I kind of pulled a muscle one time uh, while I was doing this, not during a workout or anything, but I was able to tell Devin that and he actually adjusted my workout to compensate for it. It syncs with my smartwatch and he can actually monitor my movements when I'm working out and tell me to slow down or speed up or go higher or lower. And it's in Devin's voice, which is crazy. And they kind of gamify it and give you points when you hit a streak, which is weirdly motivating. So yeah, I've really enjoyed it. The workouts are challenging, but they don't kill you. Um, you know, I can do it right here in my home and fit it in with everything else I've got going on. 30 minutes a day is better than no minutes a day. And I think over time, I can really tell a difference. And apparently I'm not alone. It was named one of the best fitness apps of 2022 by Forbes. So look, if you struggle with sticking to a workout program like I do, I really think this might be a good solution to try. And you know, it's not a one size fits all approach. It's custom tailored to you by a certified health coach. And it's much more affordable than a personal trainer. And if you'd like to give Copilot a try, you can get 14 days for free. That includes a consultation with your personal trainer and just see for yourself. You know, little improvements every day. It goes a long way. Copilot can help. Links down in the description. But getting back to the lights, as we've seen, these things happen all over the place and with such regularity that festivals are held around them and science observatories have been built to study them. So while, yeah, a lot of these places use it as a way to bring tourists in and whatnot, there, there must be something to them. 
and there's a lot of theories around it. So let's start with the Brown Mountain Lights. So legends about the Brown Mountain Lights have been around for hundreds of years, but the first official sighting wasn't until 1912, and researchers have been studying them ever since. And most explanations fall into three categories, trains, car lights, and brush fires. But the Marfa lights, they're probably just car headlights. In case you missed it, we're in the wet blanket segment of the video. In 2004, the University of Texas sent the Society of Physics students to study the lights, and their report found that the lights correlated with car headlights on Highway 67. Like, to the point that they were able to predict when a light was going to appear based on where the cars were on the highway. So this is happening because of a phenomenon known as superior image. This is when objects appear higher than their actual position because of the way the light bounces off of layers of heat in the air. So this can make distant objects, even below the horizon, appear to be hovering in the air. And it turns out that Marfa, which is about 1,500 meters above sea level, has just the right temperature gradients along those hills to create this. It's basically a mirage. This theory was backed up by a second study published in the Journal of Atmospheric and Solar Terrestrial Physics in 2011. They investigated the lights and basically came to the same conclusion, that they were refracted from a 32-kilometer stretch of Highway 67. And the reason this only happens about 30 or so times a year is because it requires very specific atmospheric conditions to happen. Now you might be saying, wait a second, Joe, didn't you just say that this was reported all the way back in 1883? And yes, I did. But apparently there's no written record of this account. So yeah, it was a cow hand named Robert Reed Ellison, but according to Brian Dunning from the Skeptoid podcast, uh, Ellison's account only shows up in writing anywhere in the 20th century. Um, this is when his descendants reported him having said something about it. And apparently Ellison kept journals and wrote his memoirs, but never mentioned the lights in any of it. As Dunning says, quote, curious that he would leave that out. Apparently, all evidence that the lights existed prior to the arrival of automobile highways in the region is purely anecdotal. Yeah, I'm going to get some hate mail for this. <sighs> Texans love the Marfa lights. As for the Naga fireballs, some people believe they're caused by swamp gas, or methane gas from decomposing biomass in the riverbed. The methane gas bubbles rise to the surface and then ignite when they come into contact with oxygen in the air. Another theory is that they're caused by phosphine gas. And then there's a theory that they're plasma orbs formed by the surface electricity being released. But skeptics tend to believe that it's all just a hoax to draw a crowd to the festival. Um, they say the fireballs are nothing more than flares shot from across the river in Laos. Which, I mean, I imagine is true for the sake of the festival, but that doesn't mean that the lights never existed. Uh, it could have been a weird natural phenomena that spawned legend and folklore in the old days, and then the festival was born around it. For the Min Min lights, the explanations include marsh gas, piezoelectrics, or refraction. That last one is probably the real cause of the lights. In 2003, Australian neuroscientist John Pettigrew said that he solved the mystery. He even created his own Min Min light. So the lights are real, but they're caused by distant fires or bright headlights on cars. Um, you don't normally see these lights because they're over the horizon and too faint. But again, it's sort of a superior image thing, like with Marfa, because there's a layer of cold air just above the ground between the distant light and the observer, and that air can trap the light. This layer then bends the light and keeps it close to the ground, and it can be seen over long distances. Even more interesting, that cold air layer can concentrate the distant light, which prevents it from dissipating over long distances. This is actually an optical phenomenon called a Fata Morgana. So to prove his point, Pettigrew drove 10 kilometers away and turned on his car headlights at a campsite. And then his companions reported back via radio that they could see a bobbing light just above the horizon that was about half the size of the full moon. Pettigrew would turn his headlights on and off and the Min Min light would disappear and come back again. You might be saying, but what about the tales of the aboriginals that clearly happened before automobiles? Those stories often mention stationary lights, so they were probably distant campfires under a Fata Morgana illusion. Now, as for the chasing people thing, <laughs> which is probably the freakiest, I imagine there could be a parallax effect by the bending of the light to kind of make it look like it changes directions along with you as you, you know, move around. Um, and with that light being concentrated, it might look a lot closer than it actually is. It's just a thought. As for the Ozark spook light, again, it's probably car headlights. That part of the country's geography can often cause warm air to be trapped close to the ground after the sun sets, and this produces good conditions for, again, that superior image thing that makes car headlights visible even though they're below someone's direct line of sight. And here's the kicker. Um, these lights weren't actually reported in a published account until 1926, which also just happens to be the year that Route 66 was built through the area and cars started driving down it. As for the Hostelin lights, um, we still don't quite know exactly what causes these. These might be the most mysterious ones here, but there are a few theories. 
One 2007 study showed that the lights were at a very low altitude, just a few meters above the tree line. So the hypothesis is that these lights are caused by large deposits of the element scandium around the Histalin region. So the idea is that the dust off of the valley ignites due to the scandium reacting quickly with the acids in the air, and then a burning dust cloud rises and floats or is moved away by the wind until the fuel is burned off. So that's how it travels. And a recent hypothesis suggests that macroscopic Kulun crystal clusters in a plasma cause the lights. That is some Star Trek level techno babble. It's based on an FTL nanoprocessor with 25 bilateral kelolactrals. It's thought that the plasma is produced by radon decay that ionizes the air with alpha particles. Yet another explanation is that it's a product of piezoelectricity. Yeah, this one's the most interesting to me. Apparently there's large crystal deposits in the Hesdalen Valley, and it's thought that the geologic pressure on them might cause a discharge of electricity in the form of plasma. Basically ball lightning. Which, by the way, this might apply to a lot of these ghost lights. They, a lot of them seem to happen around mountain ranges, which are formed by geologic pressure. And finally, uh, yeah, once again, we have car headlights responsible for the Paulding light. In 2010, researchers at Michigan Technological University set out to solve the mystery, and they brought along a telescope. Luckily for them, the lights actually showed up, and when they looked through the telescope, they clearly saw car headlights. But that was not enough. They kept going with it. They looked for the part of the road where the light originated. Using an adopt the highway sign they saw on their telescope, they were able to track that spot using Google Maps. So one researcher went out to the spot on US 45 and recorded when cars passed it. Other researchers stayed in Paulding and logged the light appearances. And yeah, the light appeared every time a car drove by. But wait, there's more. They were able to actually recreate the lights themselves. One researcher drove the car along a highway and put on his hazard lights, and they clearly saw the hazard lights. The researchers also conducted atmospheric modeling along US 45, and basically rising heat off of the pavement may cause the light's distortion. And then an inversion layer in the sight line between the road and the viewing spot may create a very stable air that accounts for the light's visibility of about 7 kilometers from the highway. So yeah, there's a lot of different explanations for these things that we've seen, but uh, it's really just the one that sticks out the most is cars. This does not stop people from believing in the lights though. And let's face it, when it comes to tourism and making some money, a lot of people lean into the quote from the man who shot Liberty Valance when he said, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. So, um, I'll be honest, I, I didn't like making this video. <laughs> I don't like this. Because I love these stories, I love the folklore around them, I don't want to fart all over that. Like, sometimes I think there should be some mystery in the world. This isn't harming anybody. So I'd say if you're ever thinking about going to see any of these lights, just, just go do it anyway. Don't, don't let me ruin the magic for you. Folklore is fun. Oh, and just think, when you're there, you could share this video with anybody else that's there to see them and ruin it for them too. It's always fun. But yeah, let me throw it back to you guys. Have any of you actually seen any of these lights? Is this something that makes sense? Or is there something else that you saw that's just like, no, there's no way it's car headlights, Joe, you don't know what you're talking about. I would love to hear stories about people who have seen these ghost lights or any of the, the legends or lore around them. Just, just have fun in the comments. I want to hear about it. And don't forget to check out the free 14-day trial of Copilot, including a free consultation with a fitness trainer. Just click the link in the description. All right, big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to support this channel, forming an awesome community, and just being a great sounding board and a great group of people. I can't thank you guys enough. There are some new uh, Patreon members I need to shout out real quick. We got Brian Cardi, Megan Virgil, uh, The Tenacious Peach, <laughs> Jerry, Kelly Jean Dobbs, Hermaphroditus X, uh, John Tulos, Marty and Amy, Ebony Bray, Eric Merrill, Matthew Jin, and Molly Alcorn. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them and get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe and do it. And it's very much appreciated. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I'll put a little uh, thing right there. You can go check that one out. Google thinks it might be up your alley. Or if you're watching on your browser, you might have a little sidebar on the side. Check out any of the thumbnails that got my little face on it. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.